A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh Welcome back to Ramadan Reflections Today is the 27th day of the month of Ramadan for 2023 Getting close to the end of the month but we still have some exam- exemplary women to speak about For the next two days we're going to be turning our focus to an exemplary role model of our era, of our religion, of our teachings, and that is the daughter of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. May God bless him and his family, the one and only Fatima al-Zahra. May God's peace and blessings be upon her. Now, although like other women, you know, she too is not mentioned by name in the Quran. However, she has the distinction of having the shortest chapter of the Quran to speak about her, Surah Al-Kawthar. And her mention and moral qualities and excellences are peppered throughout the Quran. You can't you know, uh, past a few pages probably without finding a verse about Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her. Now, the verses which I want to reflect upon today in this month of Ramadan as we near to the end of the blessed month and thus our Ramadan Reflection Series for 2023 would come to a close, comes to us from chapter number 3, Surah Ali Imran, verse number 61. Now, before I go into the verse, I think we need to have a bit of a breakdown on the history of the revelation of the verse before we can actually appreciate the centrality of Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her, and woman in the Quran in general, and her specifically. So nearing to the end of the life of our Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, one of the things that he was doing was sending letters to various regions, inviting them to Islam and to acknowledge his prophethood and the finality of prophethood at that. Now, one of the regions which responded and sent a delegation to Medina to meet this man who was claiming to be a prophet, they didn't know for sure, were the Christians of Najran. Najran, brothers and sisters, is a region in the southern half of the Arabian Peninsula in what is today known as the country of Yemen. The same Yemen that's been bombed incessantly by the man who claims to be the the servant of the two holy shrines. So contingent of Christians came from Yemen, they come to Medina, they meet the beloved prophet, may Allah bless him and his family, and debated many theological points. However, the one prime discussion that that they focused on was the divinity of Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. They believed wholeheartedly, although irrationally, that because Jesus had no earthly father, that God himself was his father. And that he himself, Jesus, was a part of the divine nature, being a part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Quran had you know, categorically denied such claims in many, many verses of the Quran. However, once again, the Quran had to reveal verses to Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and his family, which are found in chapter 3, which would clarify this point once more for this group of Christians and hopefully for all time to come. Now the verses came down that there's no difference between Adam and Jesus. Both came from nothing and God said be and they were. But the Christians weren't willing to listen to the Prophet Muhammad. God May God bless him and his family and the wisdom of the Quran. And so there's no other choice left other than to engage in what is known as a mubahala. A known practice of that time which is actually even mentioned in the Bible in which people that are disputing with one another would enter into mutual prayer of imprecation for God to send his damnation, his latinat, upon the liars out of two groups of individuals. So the verse under review today was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and his family, telling him that if there's no movement, then we have to take this step further and engage in a mubahala. Christians were okay with it, the Muslim, the Prophet was okay with it, so let's move on. The stage was set, the, you know, the, uh, the event was going was to go down. Now what does Fatima Zahra, peace be upon her, have to do with this Mubahila? This is between the Christians and the Prophet, right? Was it just not a debate between the two of them? Where does Fatima Zahra fit into this equation, peace be upon her? Why am I giving you this entire story? And telling you that she is a, a, a woman of excellent moral and virtues and Allah mentions her in the Quran, where does she fit into it? Well, let me review the verse of how Allah wanted the Mubahala to take shape, who was allowed to attend, who should attend, who must attend. 
And then we can come back and discuss these finer points, brothers and sisters. So in chapter 3, Surah Al Imran, verse 61, Allah says the following After the true knowledge has come to you, whoever still disputes with you about him, about Jesus, Isa, say in challenging them, Come then, let us summon our sons and your sons, and our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, and then let us pray and invoke Allah's curse upon those who lie. This is a very powerful verse which we don't have time to review in detail, but the verse, brothers and sisters, makes it clear to Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, of what he has to do. And we can really only understand this if we understand some Arabic, which I will just touch upon. Because the Prophet is told to bring three groups of people, his sons, and they will bring their sons, his women, number two, and they will bring their women, the Christians meaning, and his selves, and they will bring their selves. Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, had no sons that survived past infancy as we know. But history shows us across the board that he took his two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein, peace be upon both of them. Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and his family, while in Medina at the event of Mubahala, had at least nine wives at one time. Yet in the event of Mubahala, he brings only one woman, and that too his young daughter. None of his wives or any of the female companions were, who were in Medina accompanied the Prophet, just as none of the boys in Medina accompanied the Prophet to represent his sons. And then the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, brought himself, and he brings his cousin, his son-in-law, his rightful successor, Imam Ali, peace be upon him, as his self. Well, I don't say that my son-in-law is myself, I am myself. But he brought Imam Ali. He didn't bring his, alayhi salam, he didn't bring his father-in-laws, didn't bring his companions, didn't bring any other close relatives, his uncles, his cousins. They were in Medina, why didn't they come? To be representations of the self of the Prophet, the nafs of the Prophet. And this is where it gets interesting because the word used for women, I'm just going to focus on that, is the plural. Now in Arabic, you know that there's a single, a dual, and a plural. One person, two people, three or more. Don't tell me that the Prophet didn't know Arabic. Don't tell me that Allah didn't know Arabic. The Prophet is told, bring your, that he says, we'll bring Nisa Ana, our women. Yet he brings one woman with him, one daughter, nobody else. No wives, no female companions, nobody. Why? Nine wives are sitting there in Medina. Why not bring few, you know, two of them and then your daughter, or three of them and then your daughter? What makes her so special, Fatima Zahra, that she, alayhi salam, becomes a representation of the entire faith of Islam and the truthfulness of the message of the Qur'an and the stand of her father, the Prophet Muhammad. May God bless him and his family. Well, scholars do note, you know, that there is precedence in the Qur'an and other Arabic sources where the singular or the dual are used, or are meant rather, but the plural is used. Even Allah refers to himself as we, nahnu, many times in the Noble Qur'an, although they're just one God. But why did Allah refer to Fatima Zahra? Or why did Allah say to the Prophet to bring your women and he only brings one? I don't think we have time to go through that today. So let me conclude and just mention that Allah has shown us through the status of women, uh, through his book, uh, and we've seen how women have already been spoken about. We've seen how Fatima Zahra is also spoken about in the Quran as being the perfect representation of Islam in its totality and women in their totality in the event of Mubahala, an event which is celebrated today as an aid throughout the world by followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Unfortunately, it's a sad reality that because Many other Muslims have either ignorance or hatred for the Ahlul Bayt and the, you know, they've chosen to disregard this event and the preeminence of such a great woman as her, as her being, the perfect representation for all. To take her as a role model, they would take rather the wives of the Prophet, which we will look at uh, very soon. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I'm going to conclude right now and I'm going to note that we will continue tomorrow on the theme of Fatima Zahra, peace be upon her. And the unique topic of the respect that Allah shows to Fatima Zahra in the revelation of Surah Al-Insan. 
that Allah respects the daughter of the Prophet, a woman, a mother, a great personality. Until tomorrow, brothers and sisters, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.